This is Abe from cinemadailyus.com, and I'm thrilled to be speaking with Christina Ricci about her new film, Hereafter. Hi, how are you? Good? I'm great. I'm great. How about you? Good, good. What attracted you to this film? Um, I liked that this movie is sort of an exploration of an idea or concept, a question. Um, I feel like that's one of the things that made sort of the 70s era filmmaking so incredible. And um, it was sort of everything seemed to be an exploration of the meaning of life, meaning of love, uh, questioning existence. Like, um, And movies were made around whole concepts um, and uh, or fears, you know, like life concepts, life questions. And um, I really liked that about this project. That's how the script made me feel. Like somebody was trying to figure something out in their life through art. And that's always, I think, a really great use of art. Yeah, I like that perspective. And when I saw the title of this film, I remembered that you were also in a film called Afterlife with Liam Neeson, uh, maybe about a decade ago. And that, of course, when you were younger, you were in Casper. Is there something about life after death that particularly appeals to you? No, I mean, I think that I really like uh, meaning. And I like when people make things that are meaningful to them. And um, death is something that really affects people in both these situations, um, both movies, Afterlife and this movie, were inspired by loss of a loved one, um, and um, and the questions that those those events bring up. And so I think, you know, that's probably why you see. But out of, I mean, I've made a lot of movies, so if only three of them are about that. Out of as many as I've made, then you know, it's not too not too shabby, not too bad. You know, not too much of a theme. <laughs> That's fair. What do you make of the idea that people would need to be coupled in order to essentially cross over to whatever comes after life? You know, I don't necessarily believe that. Um, I do think it maybe it speaks to this this idea that in order to move on, you need to have gone through or everything that a human being needs to experience in order to move on in a spiritual way, to have fully gone through the exercise of being alive. Um, so that I could see, uh, but I, I don't think literally, but I also don't really know what I believe about afterlife. So I don't know, I'm open. That's fair. So how would you describe your character in this film and what, what her role is for our protagonist? Well, she's really, so um, So our protagonist dies and once he's dead, he meets my character who um, who is sort of like uh, a gatekeeper, a bureaucrat in the afterlife um, and spells out, she sort of decides who gets to move on and who has still has some work to do. And she explains to him basically the rules and why he's gonna have to spend a little bit more time on earth. And basically it's, it's the, it's like you were, like you touched upon that until you find your soulmate, you are not, you are, you cannot move on uh, in, in death. Right. And he asks her this question and doesn't really get a straight answer, which is why is it that she is in this role? Because is she somebody who has lived and what, what is it that makes her the right fit to be doing this job? Yeah, and that is never answered. She is a person who has desired to have a job in the afterlife. And I think that says quite a bit about a person. <laughs> they don't need to have a job, but she wants one. So, you know, she clearly is just a person who, who has that need and drive and, uh, you know, wants to, to uh, have power and order and, you know, a real bureaucrat, someone who just loves rules. <laughs> so most of your scenes take place in an office, which I'm sure was filmed just in a standard place with, you know, no real background, but has this very sort of haunting backdrop of people just sort of being sucked up into the air or whatever is happening. What was shooting that like without that being there? That was fine. I mean, all of the, uh, we shot in actually the Brooklyn Film Museum. Um, and uh, there's like an area in one of the lobbies that has a lot of diffused light and background. Um, what was amazing is when I read the script and I, lo I loved it and wanted to be a part of it, and I went to do the shooting, I hadn't really taken in 
how much dialogue was just like one angle, just touch. She really talks a lot, this character. So um, that was the only thing that was kind of daunting. There's just pages and pages of talking. <laughs> Well, she doesn't talk quite as much as your main co-star, and that's Andy Carl. What can you say about working with him? I loved working with Andy. He was great. He was so much fun, and he really um, was so good in the part and such a great scene partner. He's really um, talented and charming and dynamic and fun to watch uh, in this role. And you don't get to interact with a lot of other people. Is there any, any, other, any other characters in the film that you would have liked to share scenes with? Um, yeah, sure. I think, I mean, I love them all. I love the family scene. Um, you know, the mother, his mother, such a incredibly wonderful character. That scene is so uh, painful, but also funny. Do you think that a movie about a man wandering the relatively abandoned streets of New York City trying to get people to talk to him has an added resonance now that it's being released around the pandemic? Maybe. I don't know. <laughs> I guess so. I guess so. Yeah. Although I feel like we were mostly in our houses, weren't we? Trapped inside. Movies about people being trapped inside. That's true. And did you, I think you did get to debut this film right before the pandemic at CineQuest in March of 2020. What, were you there and what was it like and what, what do you think has changed since then related to the film? I was not able to be there. I was traveling for um, other jobs, so I wasn't able to be there at that time, unfortunately. Well, you do have some pretty cool other projects coming up, I know. Can you share anything about Yellow Jackets? Yeah, I'm in Vancouver right now. This is not my sign behind me. I'm in an Airbnb. Um, uh, and I'm shooting. It's it's sort of, um, it's, it's, it's horror. It feels very much like a Stephen King meets some other tonally. I mean, I, I haven't really been given the full, we're like, four episodes in so no one's really given me the talking points yet or what I'm allowed to say totally that it's like but I really it feels very Stephen Kingy this show um and it's it's scary it's haunting it's creepy um I play a really creepy person which is fun and um and it's great Juliet Lewis is in it and we have lots of scenes together and that's been really fun so yeah you have a lot have, of, yeah please old, sorry we all have older and younger versions of us which is pretty fun too. Yeah, no, it looks great. And you've done a lot of series over the course of your career. What do you like most about doing television? I've done three, only three series. Oh, this is my third? Yeah, um, I like, I liked, um, I mean, I like TV. Um, the idea of exploring a story over a much longer period of time, it feels like you have more time to explore different things in detail and, um, uh, it feels more indulgent, really, as an artist and as an actor. Um, and I mean, I loved being an EP on my show when I did my show for Amazon. I really like the creative process of like creating television and being a part of all of those kind of decisions. It's a little bit different just as being an actor on a show. Um, you're much less involved in story and all that kind of stuff. Um, but that's fun too, because you get to sort of find out what's happening and what happens. And um, Yellow Jackets has a lot of mystery. So we're sort of finding out things as an audience would in many ways. And you're also set to join an existing franchise with The Matrix 4. I assume you can't say anything, but if there is anything you can share, uh, that's, <laughs> are you excited about it? Yes, I'm very excited, but I can't share anything about it. <laughs> I expected that, but I figured I would ask anyway. Is, is there a particular role from your career or roles that you find most people associate you with? And is that something that you're happy about? You know, everybody sort of has their own, uh, people have their own, they, they, you know, it seems like people have one thing that they, they associate me with and they hold on to that and it means a lot to them. So, I mean, it's nice to have things that mean so much to people, certainly. Have some of your art actually means something to someone is, is what we're doing it for, really. So, yeah. Are there any highlights that you feel are underseen and underappreciated that you wish people would talk to you about more? No, not really. Um, no, I mean, I, I feel like each kind of thing I've done has its own audience and, and group of people. And there isn't really much that I feel that I have any sort of um, 
angst about lack of audience or anything. Yeah. Great. Well, everyone should see Hereafter when it opens at the Cinema Village in New York and on demand this Friday, July 23rd. Thank you so much, Christina, for speaking with me today. Thank you. Have a good rest of your day. You too.